Very well, uh, greetings to all of us and a very good and a happy Sabbath to you all. I am blessed to be with us this evening. As the Sabbath sets in, it's really a beautiful Sabbath over here. Uh, it, uh, the sun goes down a little bit later because I think of the position of the sun right now. And it's a good thing to welcome the Sabbath, uh, considering the word of God, praying, meditating, and surrendering our lives to God. Um, today, uh, we want to talk about an interesting subject, and I have entitled that subject, Worship, the Final Showdown. So why don't we pray as we get started and then we could continue. Father in heaven, I am so thankful for grace, for the opportunity, for the moments that you've given unto us. How I pray that the words that I'll speak will not be my words, but your words. It's my prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. We're looking into this subject, worship, the final showdown. And I'm thankful to be here indeed, because God is good. So I'm going to share real quick and um, my screen, and then we can be able to look at these things together because these things are very important. Uh, worship. The final showdown. I'm trying to share my screen so that um, we all might be able to study these things together. Worship, the final showdown. Let's see. Uh, it's coming. Uh, let me see again. Good. Uh, there we go. So, I think. Uh, and be able to share it now. Just one minute. Seems that. Good. I think that now you are able to see my screen there. And yeah, good. So if you're able to see my screen, that's what you're talking about today. Worship, the final showdown. Now, we are living in the final days of this world's history. Yeah, all of us know that. We are living in the very tip toe of Daniel chapter 2. If you look at Daniel chapter 2, we are having that image. And that image has the head, the shoulder, the hands, uh, the belly, the chest, the belly, the thighs. Then we have the legs and then we have the toes. Now we're not just anywhere, we are at the tips of the toes. The history of this world is about to close and I hope to be able to do a presentation on the avengers of the final days. We're hearing of earthquakes in Syria, Turkey. We're hearing of people dying as a result of um, intoxication. We're hearing of varying number of people who are killing their relatives. Love is uh, uh, drawing cold. Crazy things are going on in this world. Crazy things are going on in this world. So we know we're living in the final days. And while we're living in the final days, we need to understand that Revelation chapter number seven tells us that angels are sent to come and speak to angels who are holding the four winds of the earth. And why is it that they are coming to speak to angels who are holding the four winds of the earth? This is the reason. Because there are events that are transpiring in the system of the world, um, in the environment, there are things that are happening that have been prophesied and they're moving so fast and yet the people of God, me and you, are not prepared 
for the close of probation. And so the descent of those angels is an answer to the prayer of Jesus Christ. As we've read that from the writings of Ellen White, Jesus Christ was crying to the Father. You see the image behind me is Jesus in the most holy place. And what's the cry of Jesus Christ? My blood, my blood, my blood, my blood. Four times Jesus Christ made it clear to the Father that at the history of the world closed, and this should be around 1888, for those who've studied uh, the chronology of events in our visions, when America was attempting to debate the enactment of the National Sunday Law, the 1890, the first martyr of the Sunday Law, a seven day Adventist who was faithful, went working on Sunday, and because of that, he was prosecuted. Jesus Christ in the most holy place, my blood, my blood, my blood. Why? The church was still in strife. The church was still in criticism. The church was still fighting for non-essential. It was Laodicean. They were not ready. And Jesus looked at the wounds, the scars in his hand. His blood, he remembered the experience in 31 AD and the years before. And how that sacrifice should go to a waste. He pleaded. And because of that pleading, there was a retreat of the Roman armies, if I speak prophetically. And in that retreat of the Roman armies of 66 AD, spans between that time and when the National Sunday Law is finally passed, then we have the second attack which, in which now the Romans do not retreat from Jerusalem. Brothers and sisters, we are living in very serious prophetic times. And the problem is the people of God are not ready for the seal of the Father to be put on their forehead. We're going to look at that in a little while. Worship. Now, what is it about worship? The Bible says, because worship is the real thing in the three angels' message, as I share my screen really, my screen really quickly, uh, the word of God uh, in, uh, sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter number one, verse nine, the Bible says, the things that are being, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun. So basically everything that we are seeing playing out in the final days of this world's history are a repetition. The book of Daniel is also a book of repetition and expansion. The book of Revelation the same. The details that were not given in the prior chapters are explained with more details in the following chapters. So even our life is a repetition of events that have been. We are somehow in the scripture reenacting, or rather today in our worldly pursuits, reenacting some portion of the scripture. Either we are joining with the holy angels of God, or we are joining with the evil angels who fell from glory. Well, the next slide there, as you can be able to see now, Daniel chapter 8, verse 24, very important text that we should look at one time. And his power shall be mighty, but not eat by his own power. This is speaking about the little on in its vertical ascent. As the little on was making the horizontal ascension to power, which actually restores uh, its political governance, scope of governance. It was also able to ascend, uh, and in ascending, it was actually trying to overcome the sanctuary and its services by bringing down the daily, which we know is paganism, but can also be the services of the sanctuary and how. Because paganism also, in a way, had services and rituals that were 
countering the real services of the heavenly sanctuary. You understand now? So in Daniel chapter 8, verse 24, we are told, and his power shall be mighty. The power of the little on is shown as being mighty, but God is all mine. Man all his own power. So this power is not his own. Why? We'll be able to see whose power this is. And he shall destroy wonderfully. The little on destroys wonderfully. He shall prosper. We are seeing prosperity of the little on. He shall practice the things that he shall do and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. So there is coming a time when God's people were not only uh, destroyed, but will also be destroyed as the history of this world comes to an end. Now, this actually portrays the movements of the little on in the dark ages and post dark ages. But why? Because these things that have been shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. Verse 25 says, and through his policy, the policy of the little on. The little on as policies that have been put, policies by which, without our knowledge, are being used to control our mind and to put us into a position where we will readily, by submission or by what they call while you are doing uh, your GHCR or social studies, that uh, you are able to adapt with time. And so uh, they bring in uh, what helps you to adapt so fast to a particular lifestyle. And by that way, they colonize. So the little on would colonize by policies. Also, it shall use craft or cause craft. That's a very important word there. Cause craft, deception. Uh, the, the craft is uh, a way in which to deceive. Uh, without being detected, to prosper in his hand. So in the end of time, there will be craft in the medical system, craft in educational system, craft in the health system, craft even in religion, all right? Prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy men uh, uh, under the covering of peace many shall be destroyed. There are a lot of things that are going on that if you've studied are actually craft. We are hearing of tornadoes, we are hearing of floods, we are hearing of extreme droughts, we are hearing of uh, or, um, extreme wild wind, uh, hurricanes, we're hearing about uh, 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 um, extreme weather patterns, earthquakes, and all these things are suggestedly man-made and and sometimes they're not natural occurrences because there are things that could be done to trigger them uh, what i'm saying is there is a lot of craft that is going on under the guise of climate change and its agenda that is actually going to overrule the world and put people ready to offer themselves to worship the beast and the powers that be so by peace shall many be destroyed it might not be with weapons this time, except for those who will say, be faithful to the very end of time, like the three Hebrew boys. And you see, it's only the three Hebrew boys who are in trouble, because many people had been by peace caused to bow down before the golden image, including the Israelites who are taken in bondage. They were right there worshiping the golden image, the only three boys who said, no, nah, we shall not worship your God. And now it says he shall stand up against the prince of princes, but it shall be broken without hand, isn't it now? All right, now the final issue. What is this final issue? Revelation chapter 14, verses number, uh, if, 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 if uh, you're able to see that, Revelation chapter 14 and verses number 6. What's the real issue? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on earth and to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. Verses number 7, listen to this. Saying with a loud voice, fear who? God. And give glory to him. Singular. 
for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him. So the final issue in the history of this world is worship. And who is he that the first angel's message calls us to worship? The first angel's message is calling us to worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. The God that we are to worship is the God that made the heavens and the seas and the fountains of water. And that God is the Father. You can be able to find that as you continue reading through the scriptures because this is very clear that the God who created the heavens and the earth and the seas and the fountains of the water, that's the Father. Jesus Christ clearly says that in Matthew, I think, 11, 25. That it is Jesus Christ who is the Father of, or rather, uh, the Father, who is the Father of Jesus Christ, God, who actually created the heavens and the earth, doesn't it? All right. Now, the first angel's message is calling us to worship. If you go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, the Bible says, and they worshiped the dragon. So you can see that actually the great controversy in chapter 13 is worship. So there is one message in Revelation 14 calling us to worship the Father, him who created the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. Revelation chapter 13, and they worshiped the dragon. So there is also a call to worship the dragon. Who are we going to worship? Are we going to worship the father or are we going to worship the dragon? Which gave power unto the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with the beast? So they worship the beast and by extension, by and large they worshiped, it evolved. Beast worship evolves into satanic worship. Uh, without their knowledge, of course. We say by craft, by peace, by policies, by creeds, and all these things, all right? Chapter 13, verse 8 is interesting. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the books of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. All that dwell on the earth, whose names are not in the book of life, they are going to worship who? The beast. When the final history comes, there is going to be a worship of the beast. And by extension, we are going to have the worship of uh, the dragon. And we know that is written in verse 16, and they cost all both small and great and rich and poor, free and born, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their forehead. So those who worship the beast and worship the dragon receive a mark of the beast in the forehead and in their right hand, isn't it? Verses number 17 says, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Interesting. So there is a receiving of a mark as a result of the worshiping of the beast. What about Revelation chapter 14, verse 1? And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four what? Thousand. Having his father's name written in their forehead. Other version says, having his name and the father's name written in their forehead. In other words, the name of the father and his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. So there is the receiving, or rather, sorry for that. There is the mark of the beast on those who worship the beast and by and large worshiping the dragon. And there is a mark or a seal of the living God on the forehead of those who worship this father through the son. So we worship the father through the son. The world worships the dragon through the beast. Right. Um, so they're literal and spiritual, and this is what happened in uh this is what happened in Babylon, in literal Babylon. Only three Hebrew boys stood against the worship of the Babylonian God. Because Babylon had and I mean had uh, 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 the uh what would they say? They had brought to the um 
uh, to the field, uh, uh, I mean, exposed uh, this, uh, I, I mean, uh, golden image to be worshipped. But these three boys, they said, no, we're not going to worship your gods. And then later, uh, Babylon, the king Nebuchadnezzar says, you are God. So you can be able to see that they are their God, whom they stood up for a while, the whole world was bowing down to the Babylonian God. Is it possible that as you're speaking right now, churches, denominations, people, governments, are free born, I mean, poor, rich, people are bowing down to worship. Let me pause and tell you. The final controversy is about when you worship, who you worship on that day, and how you worship. And I'm going to show these things in this presentation. When you worship, who you worship, how you worship. These are the final things that the devil has been doing and trying to confuse the remnant of God's people so that they can have a false God. There's a worship of false God and worship that God in a wrong way. We're going to see celebrations. We are going to see percussions and heavily syncopated music. We are going to see craziness in God's congregation. This is going to prepare them to worship when you hear the sound of the psaltery, dulcimer, and all those things, the drums, then you are set to worship. So those celebrations set the world for the worship of the false god. And then when they worship the false god, then they must take the sign of the false god. What's the sign of the false god? The sign of the false god is a false day of worship. That is the mark of the identity of the beast. And that mark is Sunday. While on the other side, the Sabbath is not the seal. Rather, the Sabbath is the sign of the sea. And so they are sealed by the Father's name. And being sealed by the Father's name, how is it that they show by the Sabbath? It's a sign that will show that I'm the Lord God that doth sanctify you. Ezekiel 20, verse 12, and verses number 20. All right? So it's as it was in the literal, Daniel chapter 3, verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship. So that is the worship there again, the golden image which thou hast done one. I said, it's the same thing we read. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of war. A lion, and the dragon gave him power. The dragon was able to give him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all, how much? All of the world wandered after the beast, isn't it? That's interesting. And in wandering after the beast, the Bible says, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him. Isn't that interesting? Well, and the dragon was cast out, and that dragon, the old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceived the old world. So that dragon is Satan, and all roads are leading to Vatican. All roads are leading to Vatican. It might not be literally, it might not be by planes flying towards that place. While it's true, it, there could be such movements, but spiritually, everyone is quickly being shaped to accept the doctrines and the dogmas, the forms of worship and the display of, and the pomp of the uh, holy, uh, uh, quote unquote, uh, that word holy, because it might not be really holy in the literal use of the word, uh, public church. Well, let me look at this now, because this might be interesting for you to not. Uh, remember, the issue is worship. Who are you worshiping? Where are you worshiping that person? And how? 
All right, now, if you allow me to uh, look together with you, um, the Vatican City on the 7th of June, I'm trying to take us through what happened before. 2020 reported that Pope Francis in his weekly address said that the Holy Trinity is saving love in a world filled with corruption, evil, and the sinfulness of men and women. Now, here is the Trinity God as a saving God. They are saying, and, and where is this? I'm going to show you this because the, secondly, they say Trinity God as empowering and liberating. So it's going to save the world. It's also going to empower and liberate the world, the Trinity God. On the same day, Cardinal Board delivered his message and declared, as reported by RBA News, that the Trinitarian understanding of God is very empowering and liberating. He is a God who lives in a community. Now, that phrase is interesting because um, it's, 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 it's sort of a singular a pronoun. Um, all of you understand that that phrase is used in the belief book after referring to uh, God as being one. It says in belief number uh, is it two or three, God is one, colon, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then as you continue, it says he. So that's very important for you to see that actually the concept being portrayed there would, if we believed a tritheistic understanding of God, would be they. If, if, if you have been, uh, I mean, that simple English would be they. But it goes on by saying he, meaning the three are one. Otherwise, it would have been they. And you can challenge me on that because uh, English is my third or second, third language. Yeah. Or, uh, but I think that that should be very simple. Well, um, as you continue, says Cardinal Boss said, the family, the country, the world can learn from the Trinity how to live a nurturing life, empowering, uh, empowered by a sense of sharing community. He also stated that humanity can solve its problem through the sense of community and common good. God shares everything among the Trinity. We too can seek an equal world where greater justice is done for all. The message of Cardinal Bo of Young Young on, on Trinity. Uh, interesting, you need to pause because the Pope spoke um, um, Vatican uh, City on the 7th of June and it's reported Pope Francis address says the Holy Trinity is the saving love in the world. Cardinal Bo on the same day says the same thing. And interesting enough, look at what Cardinal Bo says. God shares everything among the Trinity. God shares everything among the Trinity. We too can seek an equitable, uh, 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 we too can seek an equitable world where greater justice is done for all. So, uh, there is God and there is the Trinity. It doesn't make sense how God shares everything among the Trinity. Who is this God and what makes up the Trinity? Interesting is, it continues, because the Trinity God is emphasized as the solution to a broken world, this obviously will pose a problem if there are people that are not embracing the Trinity God solution, as Cardinal Bo clearly put in the following words. Listen to this. As Cardinal Bo continues to speak, he says, as we look around many families, they lie wounded. This is during the COVID crisis. And people have looked at COVID and seen its prophetic implications, whether you look at it as a pandemic or as a pandemic, It's all involved in the final history of the world, uh, as the avengers of the final days play out. As you look around, many families lie wounded. Our country remains wounded, and the world is at war with itself. It is not the COVID that is destroying humanity. So it's clear. The problem is not the COVID. The problem is not the climate change. All these are the craft. All these are policies. 
but through them, they peacefully introduce the real issue. And what's the real issue? Listen carefully. It's not the COVID that is destroying humanity. What's destroying humanity? It is the anti-Trinitarian tendency that has infected the family, country, and the world. Isn't that interesting? Well, look at this. Cardinal Bo informs us, yes, the world powers seek the unity principle expressed so eloquently in the Trinitarian principle. Not only nations, but every human being is in need. Every single human being is in need of the Trinitarian principle of dignity in the community. The Vatican News on 27th of October, August 2020 announced that the Pontifical Council of the Interreligious Dialogue and the World Council of Churches, which today even we, the Seventh-day Adventists, are members. If you are a good student, I am going to challenge you to go and find out how you become a member of the World Council of Churches. Indeed, brothers and sisters, I'll be honest with you. Do your good research. To become a member of the World Council of Churches, you don't need to believe on righteousness by faith. You don't need to simply say, Jesus loves everyone. You need to confess that you believe on the Trinity. And so there is no way that we would have been members of that World Council of Churches if we never believed on the Trinity as is believed by other denominations. So some people have contended that as uh, the Trinity as we believe is different from the Trinity as the Catholics believe. That could be true, that could not be true. I have done my personal research. You can do yours. And I challenge you, go to BRI, which is an official website of the church and find out what they are saying. They're actually uh, quoting from the Athanasius uh, or rather they're quoting from the uh, 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 Creed of Nicaea, and they're actually stating clearly there that what they believe is what the Catholics have believed. So I, I am not actually going to um, uh, go into trouble with that. But it, it's a study for another time. The Vatican News on the 27th announced that the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue and the World Council of Churches has released a document in which they call on all Christians to consider the importance of interreligious solidarity as the world is facing COVID-19 crisis. And so look at what they are going to reiterate, or rather to say again, because the World Council of Churches was formed many years ago, and this has been taught and preached for a long time. But now look at them, what they confirm about COVID-19. The document recommended that Christians can become partners in solidarity with all people of faith and goodwill based on the belief in the world, in the Trinity. I mean, if we love and abhor the Catholic Trinity so much, the question should be, why is it that we went in and united with them on such a false identity of God while we Assume, assuming, had a bad identity of God. This document states the PCID and the WCC finds a basis for interreligious solidarity in our belief in the God who is one in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, look at this. Uh, from books of history, we can see that those who did not subscribe to the Roman Catholic dogmas were classed as heretics and they were eradicated. We read this in the Aryan controversy books in history, and you will see that there was a time in which the church was divided into two. The two Christian theologians, Ares and Athanasius of Alexandria, did not agree on the Godhead. You will actually come to agree with me that actually BRI quotes the uh, Athanasius uh, document when they are referring to a point in which they agree with the Catholic. It's interesting to me that today, there are people who are honestly uh, promoting this doctrine while saying that the church does not teach what the Catholics teach. There's an original ch church website saying almost the same thing. 
The two Christian theologians, Aris and the Tenesis of Alexandria, did not agree on the Godhead. Interestingly, this controversy was the consequence of emperor. Listen now carefully, because the emperor Constantine is something that we have labored to expose in our open air campaigns. Constantine's effort to unite Christianity and establish a single approved faith. And I want you to understand, 321 AD, false Sabbath, 325, false God. And you are going to see these things come in almost a quick succession. The moment that we have a false God, we will definitely have a false Sabbath, or a false Sabbath and goes to a false God. And then he says, Athanasius was Trinitarian, and Aras believed that Christ had a beginning, having been begotten of the Father. In eternity, in the past, the Arian view has spread far and wide, uh, uh, and Bishop Alexander was forced to act against Arius as his teachings were causing disturbance to the church. Roman church had great power under Constantine, who wanted to bring an end to dispute. Constantine called an ecumenical council to settle the dispute. The Trinitarian viewpoint was adopted at the council, and a creed was agreed upon by the bishops present, which is known as the Nician Creed. Of course, this was not the agreement with Ari, which agreement with Arius believes. Arius and his followers were classed as heretics, and Arius was exiled, studied the seven trumpets. The attack uh, on uh, Eastern, Eastern, Eastern Rome, the removal of the three little horns. And you'll come to find that those three little horns, Daniel chapter 7, were uprooted because of their faith in a begotten son of God. The Aryan belief spread and it became the enemy of the popes and the Roman Catholic Church. However, when the church had returned to power, the papacy endeavored to destroy what they classed as heretical notions. So the Rulians, the Vandals, Ostrogoths have been completely destroyed. These three were all of Aryan belief. And you can see that actually as you study the first four trumpets of the book of Revelation chapter 8 and yeah, Revelation chapter 8. No surprise, the history repeats itself. This sentiments that the papacy are towards non-Trinitarian in the past are very much alive today. In fact, let me pause here and say, in the time of Jesus, what was the problem? You go and study for yourself. Matthew, rather, John chapter number 5, John chapter number 10. In John chapter number 10, they actually say, uh, we do not only stone thee, or rather because you claim, or rather you are healing on the Sabbath or breaking the Sabbath, but rather also because, so they are adding something, you call yourself or you say thou art the son of God. So there are two issues there that people have never seen, or at least for a long time that I was doing Revelation and Daniel seminars, People never talked about. And what was this thing? What was this thing? People say that blasphemy that uh, uh, talked about the blasphemy there. And people also talked about the reason why they wanted to uh, destroy Jesus was because Jesus was accused of breaking the Sabbath. But there was also something else which they accused Jesus of because the Bible says, but also because thou, being man, says thou art the son of God. So the problem here was Jesus claiming his sonship to the Father. And in the end of time, Pharisees are going to arise, who are going to, these Pharisees who are against Jesus were seventh day keepers. They were keeping the seventh day. They were going to the sanctuary. They were following the sanctuary services. They had a problem with Jesus saying he's the son of God. And that is 80 plus times in the New Testament. Jesus says, I am the son of God. I am the son of God. I am the son of God. God says, my only begotten son. And so that was the issue. Then we see it in the time of the Arians, and now we're seeing it playing out in the end of time. There is nothing new under the sun. Um, uh, interesting, yes, Nantrin we found ourselves accusing, uh, believing the same thing, no matter how many times you reiterate that Christ is the only begotten Son of God, 
that is not created and is most definitely the divine son of God by the virtue of his sonship. He is the divine son of God. Most probably Arius and his followers are being falsely accused of believing something they never claimed to believe in order to call them heretics because if they believed error, why would Catholicism eradicate them? Because the foundation of Catholicism is error. Daniel chapter number eight, verses number 16, 17, 19. It's all error. They came that they may bring down the sanctuary and trample the truth underfoot. So why would they have a problem with someone who is teaching error? Suddenly they would not. In order to call them heretic, history proves that papacy never sought to kill heretics, but those who follow the Bible truth. It is those who follow the Bible, the Waldensians. It is those who follow the Bible, the disciples who found it rough. All right? Time's almost up there. In those days of persecution, uh, um, let's see how Raya Smith, interesting. What was the secular power? Simply a tool in the end of the world, the church, and under its control to do its bloody bidding. And when the church delivered its prisoners to be destroyed with fiendish mockery, it made use of the following formula. And interesting, even when they were destroying Jesus, what did they do? They gave Jesus to the hands of the Romans so that the Romans would pass a verdict. And the Roman soldiers are the ones who came for him with Judas. I mean, it's repeating itself that the secular power is a tool in the hand of the church and it's under control to do its bidding, the bloody bidding. And when the church delivered its prisoners to be destroyed with fiendish mockery, it made use of the following formula. And we do leave thee to the secular arm and to the power of the secular court, but at the same time do most earnestly beseech that court so to moderate its system and not to touch thy blood, not to put thy life in any sort of danger. And then as intended, the unfortunate victim of popish aid were immediately executed. Look at this. It's interesting that this thing was in the scripture in the time of Haman and in an interesting prey in the pilgrim progress. Um, Haman said unto King Azarus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed, dispersed among the people in the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all the people. They have different set of laws. They believe differently. Our banner is written the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Okay? Neither keep they the what? The king's law. Therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay thousand talents of silver to the arms of those that have church over the business to bring it to the king's treasure. Isn't that a beautiful replay today in our lives as, as, as the world's history comes to an end? Of Daniel, it says in Daniel chapter 6, verse 16, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. The God that delivered Daniel was the true God. The God that delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the true God. I'm telling you, in the final crisis, we cannot go with a false concept of God, worshiping a false God, because he cannot deliver us. They shall put you out of the synagogues here. A time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God a service. And they, these things, will they do unto you because they have not known who? They will persecute you because they do not have the knowledge of the Father and the Son. Paul wrote, and allow me to read it for you. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1, verses number 17. As he opens his letter to the Ephesians, what is it that Paul said to the Ephesians? I will read for you in your hearing so that you might be a witness of this glorious truth that God is giving us in the end of time. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Very important. Paul wanted the Ephesians to have the spirit of wisdom and understanding or knowledge in the understanding of who God is, isn't it? Um, 
I'm going to read for you the Sunday rest bead from 1890. This is where I started. The, the, the first coming of uh, the Roman army to Jerusalem, 66 AD, then they retreated. Then they came again in 70 AD, they never retreated again. We know that there was an attempt to pass the National Sunday Law in the 18, uh, late 1880s which spanned to 1890s and 1892. There were crazy statements by Ellen White during that time. Eddie Jones was making every move, trying to help people understand what was going on in uh, the uh, Congress at that time. Friends of Jesus, what was going to, what was happening at this time? When they come the second time, would they come with a more expounded view of what they actually brought in the first time? That should be the question. Now, if any person shall deny the Trinity, here it is, not my words. He shall, for the first offense, be bored through the tongue and fined 20 pounds. And for the second offense, the offender, being thereof convicted as aforesaid, shall be stigmatized by the burning of a forehead with the letter B and fined 40 pounds. And for the third offense, the offender, being thereof convicted as aforesaid, shall suffer death without the benefit of the clutch. An interesting fact to notice is that the Sunday rest bill in Ohio had an exemption attached to it, and it read like I read. The provision of the Sunday law exempts only those who conscientiously observe the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. Arguments on the uh, Breckenridge Sunday Bill 13, paragraph one. In the purpose of the Congress, you can do your research. And then he says, this should make one wonder. Why should, uh, why, why those who held firmly to an Trinitarian belief did not receive an exemption, but were to be severely punished, whereas Sabbath keepers were exempted from the Sunday law, its persecution and exertion. It's a question that begs uh, answering. Well, it's obvious that Trinitarian Sabbath keepers pose no threat to the beast, for they will not be upheld by the spirit of true Christ who will keep them from falling. They will receive the Trinity spirit, which is the spirit of the dragon. Indeed, and I've read from S. N. Askell, the Sabbath is the sign that they worship the true God. You can go and read that from the Seers of Patmos. Indeed, the Sabbath will be the great final test for God's true people. Those who will continue to keep the Sabbath holy as God commanded will be persecuted, even sought to be killed. However, those who worship the true God of the Bible will be able to keep the Sabbath holy at that time of trouble. And this is why, before the final test of the Sabbath, the non trinitarians will be the ones sought to eradication, just as the Rulians, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths have been. Let me pause as I bring something to you now. What's the Catholic Church saying? They are saying the mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all the other teachings of the church. Now the question should be to my Adventist brothers and sisters. Why would it be? That really you can fornicate. You can steal church money. You can do every nasty thing that is going on. You will never be in the church board for disciplinary or for to be disfellowshipped. But if you touch the issue of the God, you are in trouble, my friend. The mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all the other teachings of the church. And I want to believe that what they are saying, because they are counterfeiting the truth, is what they are saying is the right understanding of God then is the central doctrine, is the central truth from which comes forth every other teaching. How can you have atonement if you have a false concept of who Jesus Christ is? If Christ is not the son of God, how can he be a perfect atonement for us? That's a question that we need to be asking ourselves. So this is very important for us to see that if this is the central doctrine of the Catholic Church, it's not Sunday. Sunday is their mark of identity. 
It's a day in which is dedicated. I think, I think I have it somewhere here. Well, let me get to this because this is equally important. Vatican II prepared the way to 1980. What happened in 1980 in Dallas, Texas? They actually passed that they would officially accept the Trinitarian teaching into the Seventh Day Adventist Church. In the 1970s, there was a Vatican II, and Vatican II was actually moving to unite the Christian movements, churches, denominations, but how? Through music. Now listen to me, we have about seven minutes to end this presentation. Physical movement in celebration. Did you ever hear that there was a certain time that even acronym for ELF was changed from New Start, which is also just um, uh, from the um, Ministry of Healing, acronyms as they are in Ministry of Healing, it was celebration. It was taught in camp meetings. It was taught in every AL seminar. It was celebration. Where was this thing coming from? In the 1970s, for your information, there was a Vatican II which was saying, how can we be one? How can we, uh, I mean, bring the, to fruition this issue of uh, oneness, ecumenism? And they said, Vatican II said, through music. So let's get the people to the form of worship. How can they worship? How to worship? The participation in the celebration should be internal, but must be on the other hand, external also. So there was an internal and external uh, uh, um, uh, uh, way of worship. Also, that is such as to show the internal uh, uh, participation by gestures, and bodily attitude. Have you seen gestures in the church today when people choirs are singing with gestures? There is acrobatic movements of, of these clubs and I don't want to be personal with anyone, but I just want us to think about these things. They were not there between 1844 and early 1900. The church never took part in uh, 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 this sort of skits. They never took part in drills. They never took part in all this marching. They never took part in this crazy music. Look at the Apostolic Church. I have never read whether they had these theatrics in the worship system. Never. And I would want to be shown. I would want to be shown. Because if I'm shown, I'll drop this thing. But really, I have never seen this theatrics, this drama, this kids, uh, this moving of hands and dancing because of this highly syncopated and overly, uh, 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 what I would call, uh, um, uh, percussive uh, music, right? The classical music is something of the past in our churches today. So there were bodily gestures and attitudes by the acclamation, responses, and singing. This is a docu document of Vatican II, page 84. Vatican II set great emphasis on song or musical celebration. Musical celebration. This was from Vatican II. If you are surprised as to why this music craze is in the church today, here it is. They were considered to be the most effective style of celebration service. From documents of Vatican II, in all popular devotions, the Psalms will be especially useful. And also, works of sacred music drawn from both the old and the more recent heritage of sacred music, popular religious songs, and the playing of the organ of the other instrument characteristic of a particular people. All right? And so the drums will be coming in. Now, let's think about that. that. Why have you brought Vatican II in the issue of worship? The great controversy is about when to worship, how to worship, who to worship. In the book of Exodus chapter number 32, listen to me carefully. Before they worshipped the golden calf, they rose up to play, to dance, to eat, to drink. There was a celebration. In Daniel chapter 3, before they actually fell and worshipped the golden image, there was music, all sorts of music that took them with praise, and they worshipped the golden image. 
It is the same thing that happens, brothers and sisters, in the event at Mount Carmel. They worship the false God, Baal God, but they scraped in their prayers. It's a skeleton and all those things. This is repeating itself as time passes and as we move into eternity. So it's the crazy music that draws people from the study of the Bible. Because if we have all this celebration, we'll spend all the time doing all this music uh, or extravagances, all these things, and music is beautiful. I love music. I play music now, rightly played music. I love it. I have them in my computer. Well played music. But it's also an instrument used by the devil to turn people away from studying the scripture. So the church would not study the scripture. Bible study was scrapped off. People are no longer now studying diligently. And then the devil brought in the false doctrine. 1970s, Vatican II. 1980, the false doctrine comes in. The watchmen are asleep. They have been taken into a frenzy by the music. You can read this in, I think, is it 2SM? Uh, yeah, something like that. I think it's 2SM, if not 1SM 36, as you continue. It's crazy, brothers and sisters. I am praying that God will help us understand. Music is good, but music has been used by the devil to achieve. Music has been used by the devil to achieve is objective and what's the objective of the devil to get us worship a false god in the end of time false worship false god and then we go to a false day all right so if you look at that little while we are going on that's what you say in a little while in a little while we are going on. We can see it playing all through. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of our seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. They're keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus. First commandment says, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. 59 minutes into the presentation, Ellen White says in this beautiful book, Patriots and Prophets, as I finish, modern spiritualism. This is one of the central tools of deception in the last days. Spiritualism and Sunday sacredness. Mark, spiritualism and Sunday sacredness. Then we are told that she was able to see Protestants stretch their hands over the girl to take hold of spiritualism. You see that? Modern spiritualism now, let's see the spiritualism and see if we are part of the people stretching their hands over the girl to get hold of spiritualism. Modern spiritualism Resting upon the same foundation is but a revival in a new form of a, a, a revival in a new form of the witchcraft and demon worship. Listen carefully, witchcraft see, and demon worship that God condemned and prohibited of all. Demon worship. They shall worship the beast, they are by worshiping the dragon. It is foretold in the scripture. Listen to Ellen White, see the scriptures with this binoculars, the binocular of the testimony, the binocular of the law, and to the testimony. If they speak not according to these things, there is no light in them. We declare that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. I have seen this verse quoted any time you teach that truth. Let's see how Ellen White uses this verse. She says, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, point to special working of Saturn in spiritualism as an event to take place immediately before, mark that word again, immediately before, immediately 
before the second advent of Christ. Speaking of Christ's second coming, he declares it that it is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. She continues. And Peter, describing the dangers to which the church was to be exposed to in the last days, says that there were false prophets who led Israel into sin. Let's stop there. False prophets led Israel. Who are Israel? We are the spiritual Israel. False prophets led Israel into sin. So there will be false teachers. And time they might not be prophets, but they're teachers. They stand in pulpits and go to theological schools. Who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. Even denying the Lord that brought them. Let's continue reading. And many shall follow their pernicious weight. Many will be moved. Second so Peter 2, verse 1 and 2. Listen to Ellen White now. Here. The apostle has pointed out, listen to this now, the marked characteristic of spiritualistic teachers. What is the marked characteristic of anyone who is taken into spiritualism? They refuse to acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Full stop. So these spiritualistic teachers have refused to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. Have we refused to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God? When we've stretched our hands over the girl and taken hold of spiritualism. Concerning such teachers, the beloved John declares, who is a liar, but he that denied that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist. That denied the Father and the Son, whosoever denied the Son, the same hath not the Father. John, 1 John 2, 2, 22, verse 23, and 23. Then she says, spiritualism. By denying Christ, denies both the Father and the Son. And the Bible pronounces this as a manifestation of the Antichrist, friends of Jesus. We taught Daniel in Revelation and never did I hear anyone, one single preacher, teach that the first identifying mark of the Antichrist is the denial of the sonship of Jesus Christ. Never did I hear any preacher preach that the first identifying mark of the Antichrist is the denial of the sonship of Jesus Christ. They gave all the characteristics of Vatican, but they never gave this. And that's how Satan has become deceptive. The most clear words of the Bible he ensures that he obscures that truth. And that's what Satan has done to us. Finally, to him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall no more go out of it, complete victory over sin, sealed by the seal of the living God. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. New Jerusalem, which cometh down from heaven from my God, and I write upon him my new name. Those who worship the true God receive the name of the Father and the name of his Son. They are forever sealed with the name of the Father and the Son. They find victory over sin. They go into the sanctuary. They come no more out. These are the 144,000. Those who worship the beast and the dragon, who worship the dragon through the beast, they receive the mark of the beast on their forehead. Which side are you going to be? John says, after the great controversy, in the book of Revelation chapter 14, John says that after these things, lo, I beheld. 
the lamb stand on Mount Zion with 144,000 having the father's name and the name of his son written on their forehead. John says in Revelation chapter 7 that angels are sent to all the four winds of the earth until my servants are sealed on their forehead. Do you know what Christ is waiting for? That the seal of the Father might be placed in our forehead. God bless you and God keep you as you meditate about these things. Let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, help us to understand the times in which we live. Help us to understand that the issue of worship is really an important issue in the end of time. And help us to make right decision in regard to who it is that we are going to worship. This is our prayer that today we make the decision to worship the God who created the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of water. May our blessings be upon us all. It's my prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.